Psalm 19. To the choir master, a psalm of David. David is the king of Israel. And David is one of the people God used in the old covenant to pen down revelation. But David does this revelation by way of poems or songs or psalms or hymns, if you want to call them that way. And so he is writing a song. And so the language of the hymn would be language of a song. And so we talked about diversity through which God gave us revelation. In some instances, God speaks to us through poems. In some other instances, he writes history. In some other instances, he gives us a law, like the law he gave on the Mount of Sinai. Different ways in various forms. To the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and is circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired as, the, as they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there's great reward. Who can design his errors? Declare me innocent from uh, hiding dens, false, from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The psalmist David here, the king himself, is beholding the glory of God, or the splendor of God, or the majesty of God, the magnificence of God, the beauty of God, the grandeur of God in creation. The king opens his eyes and looks at heavens, skies. He looks at the firmament, the uh, uh, the, the expanse above, but the king can only but see something of the revelation of God. And so he wonders, and he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. This is what a king comes to the conclusion when he sees what his very God has created. This king, we know, is a type of Christ who is soon to come. In these days, David himself has been promised, if you see in verse number 50, uh, the previous chapter of chapter 18, this is what David himself uh, says before chapter 19. He says, great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. He talks about the coming king, Christ Jesus. And he says that the king, salvation has come to the king. Of course, in this context, David would be talking about the great salvation that God gave him. If you look at there in chapter number one, the, the preface there, when God delivered him from the hands of his enemies. But then the soon coming came Christ Jesus, is the one who would sit on his father's throne forever, uh, who is the great king, King Christ Jesus. And so we'll see ultimately how this then helps us to appreciate the coming of Christ in his glory and in his splendor, something that we so need in our society today something of beholding the glory of Christ in, the, in this Psalm 19, as David, the father of Christ, is speaking here. Now, last Sunday we talked about revelation. We were looking at the fact that God has spoken, and we say that he has spoken conclusively, he has spoken finally, 
by his son or in his son, Christ Jesus. And he said that there cannot be a greater revelation. If God has undertaken to speak to us through his son, Christ Jesus, who is himself God, the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, then surely that is the climax of revelation. That is the apex of revelation. That essentially is the zenith of it, like the noonday sun of revelation. Because even scripture points to Christ. General revelation points to Christ. Everything, as I've always said, is going in the direction of Christ Jesus. Is the ultimate of, of revelations. Is the ultimate revelation that we have. Christ Jesus. And so he has revealed of something that creation cannot reveal. And in fact, he has revealed something that the prophets could not reveal. The nature of God. Because he is God. And we, we saw that last Sunday. Today I want us to uh, back up a bit and look at how God would then help us again to, uh, to see himself. God revealing himself in various ways in, at various times. We saw in Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 1. Let's back up a bit and see how God then also reveals himself uh, by way of nature or what we are calling general revelation. And so we'll squarely look at the first six verses of that chapter uh, of Psalm 19. And so you will see of something of uh, God revealing himself through what he has created, but specifically through what we call celestial, celestial hosts or the heavenly uh, uh, hosts or the sky above, the expanse, the firmament above, what we see in that circle that is above us here today. Now, what is general revelation by way of introduction or natural revelation? This is something that I'm sure is very easy. Uh, we are not saying something that is very dif difficult. You have read or you have uh, studied something of general revelation. What is it in a, in a sense? General revelation or natural revelation? Can I try? Yes, please. Yeah, this is uh, the way God um, evident, evidences himself mm -hmm. uh, to a, each and every human being mm -hmm. uh, naturally. That's good. Yes, please. Uh, so hold that thought and let him say something so that uh, we have a confluence of ideas so that uh, we find something solid. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, general revelation is that which God makes known uh, through creation. That which God makes known through creation. Yes. He said almost similar words, but through nature, through creation, through nature. Uh -huh. Yes, someone else? Yes, please, Elder Ken. I think general revelation of God is his um, evidencing of himself and his qualities mm -hmm. through that which he has made. Mm -hmm. Evidence of himself and his qualities. Mm -hmm. And that is what is captured in Romans, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Romans 1 20. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Through creation. So I've, I've picked all those things said and I've summarized them by saying God revealing or evidence himself, revealing or evidencing or disclosing or making known. Was that the word used by it? Making known, same vocabulary yes god revealing evidencing disclosing making known himself and like an adds is or is attributes 
or an insanity beings through what he has created or made. Or the Konemo said naturally or through nature. Basically, that's what we're talking about. And we will see that's why this is important. So it's basically our God revealing himself and or his perfections, as Ella Ken says, his uh, attributes. So he reveals his person and his perfections through what is created. When God reveals himself, what do you call that? When God reveals himself. What do you call that? What is the technical term for that? God's self disclosure, self revelation. And also his attributes, his reveals his, uh, uh, his uh, perfections or attributes. For example, in this case, the glory of God. So the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the glory of God, the word glory encompasses all that God is. In terms of his person, his perfections, his attributes, his beauty, his splendor, his majesty, his power, his dominion, his authority, everything that you can ever imagine. That is, in a sense, the glory of God. Of course, in Hebrew, the glory, in Hebrew, the glory means something that's heavy or weighty, in essential. So when we talk about the glory of God, we mean God's weightiness or God's heaviness, if there's something of that nature. The godness of God in what he has revealed. And so sometimes in Greek, in Hebrew, they talk about the kavod or the kavod to talk about the glory of God in terms of how God manifests himself. So the glory has to do with how God manifests himself. God is, does not have a body like us. God does not have a hand like we do. But so when he reveals himself, his perfections, his person, his attributes, we, we talk about the glory of God. How we, you know, uh, look at his, his glory, how, how we look at his, his person, how we look at his perfection, it is so different, it's so unique. Now, anyone who has, a, who has ever come close to God by way of interaction, someone like Isaiah, when he sees God in Isaiah chapter number 6, he can't help but, but wonder, what sort of being is this? He's so perfect, and I'm not. There can never be anyone who comes near God to behold his glory and is not marveling or wondering, what being is this? He cannot, you cannot come to the, for example, a perfection of God like love, and it is love as usual. Get the point? His love is a unique love. His person is a unique person. And so when Christ walk, walks in the, beach, in the beaches of, of Galilee and he does amazing things, for example, he does, he comes the storm. What exclamation do we see the apostles uh, talking about? What do they say about him? What kind of man is this? Even the storms obey him. Now, literally speaking, because that's an idiom, they're asking of what country is this man? Such a man has never existed in this world of ours. So they are marveling. That is the glory. And so when the apostle, uh, jo, uh, you know, uh, Peter, before he's, he's an apostle, when he, Christ comes to him uh, at the beach, he's fishing, and then he be, be, beholds the glory of Christ. What did the apostle say when Christ helped him have a catch, when he, he dragged him to the deep and he was able to have a catch? What, was, what were his words? Get away from me, depart from me. I'm an evil man. Is that not what you see in Isaiah? When Isaiah in September 6 says, Who is me? For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm done, I'm finished. If my eyes can behold the glory of this God, that I'm talking about. You can't behold the glory of God and be so, so happy and exuberant. Oh, wow, what amazing. You know, people dread the glory of God. The Israelites on the Mount of Sinai, when God would reveal himself unto them, they told Moses, just tell that God of yours to speak to you so that you can tell us what he has said. We don't want to come closer to him. The glory of God. 
And so the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, when we talk about the heavens there, we are not meaning uh, where God abides. The second line interprets what we mean. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies or the expanse, the sky above, the expanse, the firmament, that is what is being meant. This is poem. A poem, you really see a poem, parallelism. The, first, the second line interprets the first line. And so the second line helps us to know what it means by the heavens. In other words, the sky above, the expanse, that arc that we see above uh, the expanse of the air, the uh, atmosphere, the firmament, that is what it means. I'm sure some of your translations would capture that well. And so, obviously in verse number one, he says the heavens declare, and he says they proclaim his handiwork, the craftsmanship of God, the fact that God is the creator, the works of God, or the work of God. Now, this is a poem. In a poem, the language used is always poetic. In other words, there are instances where the writer will attribute human attributes or human abilities to non-human things, all right? That is very reminiscent of poems, those who know poems. And so he takes the human qualities and attributes them to the heavens or the skies above, the, uh, the expanse, the firmament above, that the ark above us. So he says, these heavens or the skies above, the celestial host, declare the glory of God. Definitely we know that they don't speak, isn't it? Look at verse number three. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Someone with an NIV, the NIV will put it better. There, there is no speech or yes, yes. Now, what he's saying, what the psalmist is saying, is that this expands, this, the sky above, together with its hosts, don't speak words, yet they reveal the glory of God. So, technically speaking, we are talking about something called personification, when we attribute human attributes to non-human things. He personifies the heavens and says, they are speaking, of course, as we know that they can't speak, isn't it? But what he's saying, is making a point, he's passing a point, is emphasizing a point that although they don't have a mouth to speak, they cannot speak, the sky cannot speak, it is able to reveal something of the glory of God. That is what he's trying to say here. And so that's what I want us to look at. Now, what is the difference between general revelation and special revelation? Before we delve into the text immediately. What is special revelation? You have seen what general revelation is about. What is special revelation? Because we have special revelation and general revelation. What is special revelation? Someone has a mic? Yes, please. Yeah. General revelation is that which God makes known through creation to all rational creatures. Mm -hmm. And special revelation would be that which God makes known uh, through various media mm -hmm. to objects mm -hmm. of his saving mass. Okay. Yes. Those, that particular mm -hmm. group is what makes uh, the difference. Someone else? Special revelation. I mean, this is just revision. <laughs> I'm sure you have, you have run it, the confession. Special revelation? All right, special revelation, just as Emmanuel has said, is God revealing himself or his perfections extraordinarily or supernaturally. Remember, this is ordinary, okay? That's why I call it natural revelation. What we see, what has been already created. 
Now, in special revelation, it, it is God revealing himself in an ex extraordinary manner. Or in a supernatural manner. Sometimes it's called miraculous man. For example, give examples of God. Yes, please. Yes, incarnation. Mm -hmm. We talked about some of them last Sunday. Yeah, we are coming to that. But what crescendo us into that? Before the word of God was written, how did they receive the revelation to be written? Through visions, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dreams. Angels. Direct speech or audible. Hmm? Say something. Okay. Yes. So, surely, this is different from natural revelation, isn't it? In this case, God takes initiative, initiative to then do something extraordinary, something supernatural. Above the natural, isn't it? This is natural, because it's what you're going to behold in nature. But when God takes initiative to do something supernatural, we call it special revelation. That's what makes it special. In other words, it's so unique. God doesn't have to speak to man. <laughs> he doesn't have to reveal himself to man. But when God takes the initiative to reveal himself to man, especially like we looked at last Sunday, for the sake of, rev uh, sake of you know, redemption and a relationship with him, surely that is special. And especially in the person of his son through incarnation. And so, all these things, when they are inscripturated or written down, they bring us scripture, what Emmanuel is saying. So all these things then are written down for us. Whatever God revealed through visions and dreams, direct, you know, audible voice and angels and all these things, then therefore they were written down or inscripturated. And so we have scriptures. All these ones. So we have God's special revelation in form of scriptures now. He doesn't have to talk to us through visions and dreams anymore or through angels. But something else I cannot say. Another form of special revelation is God's, God's revealing himself through his son. The incarnation of God. God incarnate. Yahweh says the word became flesh. The word was God, isn't it? And so the word became flesh and dwells, dwelt amongst us. And you have seen his, the heavens declare the glory of God. We have seen his glory. And so he reveals himself through his word and through his son. The son reveals of something of that which other forms of revelation cannot reveal, like the nature of God. And so he tells Philip, you have seen me, you have seen the father. Even scriptures still point to Christ, the son of God. This is the highest, this is the apex of revelation, special revelation. If you have an epiphany of God's son, <laughs> you have salvation. If he reveals himself to you even today, you have salvation. This is the apex of revelation. Everything climaxes upon the son of God. So that is special revelation. It's different from ordinary revelation or natural revelation. Now quickly then, Let's get to the text and draw some lessons, having seen the distinction. Now, just to add, because I'm just saying we have talked about this, God taking the initiative to reveal himself in an extraordinary manner or a supernatural manner, he would always do so by his spirit, isn't it? And by his angels or the angel of the Lord in the old covenant. We'll probably have time to look at that some other time, but... Today, I want us to focus on general revelation.
Now, observe in the text, first of all, the extensiveness of general revelation, quickly, because that's going to be very important. Observe with me the extensiveness of general revelation. Why it's called general? We are going to delve into that quickly to see why we call it general revelation. Now, look at verse number 2 and verse number 4. Someone to read verse number 2 and someone to read verse number 4 of our passage of scripture, Psalm 19. Yes, please. Day, day, mm -hmm. out speech. And night to night mm -hmm. reveals knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now, hold that thought. What is, what is the psalmist saying? Uh, the sky above proclaims its handiwork, and it does so day to day. And it does so night to night. Revealing himself, revealing the knowledge of, knowledge of God uh, without audible speech, revelation, day to day, and night to night. What does that mean? Day to day and night to night, in one word. Thank you, continuous. Or, another vocabulary for that, continuously? All the time, okay? For our, the sake of our children, all the time. It doesn't matter whether it's day, it doesn't matter whether it's night. If the sun goes into its abode to sleep, we have the moon coming and the stars. They continue the work. Now, the expanse is always there. The sky is always there. You wake up in the morning, the sky is there. You go to sleep at night, the sky is there. And at night, when the sun has gone to sleep in its abode, we see the stars and we see the moons. The heavenly host, the celestial host. So it says, whether it's daytime or nighttime, God is revealed. See the point? You cannot escape that point. <laughs> they reveal God morning, evening, daytime, nighttime, all the time, continuously. We're talking about the extensiveness of God's revelation. So it's all the time, continuously. Now, something else in verse number four. Someone read verse number four. Okay. The, their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them, we mm -hmm. are set attend for the sun. Amazing, amazing. What? Give me a word for that. Give me a word for that. Their voice goes throughout all the earth. Throughout all the earth. Everywhere. 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 Now, that is what you call general revelation. General revelation is God revealing himself or his person and perfections all the time Everywhere, meaning to all humanity. Everywhere, all the time, to all. Surely, if it is everywhere and it is all the time, it is available to all humanity. That's why it's called general revelation. It's available for everyone. All human beings, without exception, without distinction. And so we call it universal revelation of God. So that's what David is saying. He's saying, just to put it down, writing, that these celestial hosts, these expanse heavenly bodies, reveal the glory of God universally. So we can also call it universal revelation of God, available to all humanity, all the time, everywhere. In other words, it is accessible to every human being. It is accessible to every human being. 
you will see why that is very important. But secondly, as you continue to look at the psalm, we are looking at the extensiveness of your revelation. It is available to every human being, all the time, everywhere, universally. Secondly, the celestial host, David is saying, reveal God's glory in a general way. I'm going to explain that shortly. Look at verse number one and compare verse number one to verse number seven that we read. There's some point I want to make there. How is God described in verse number one? What is the name attributed to God or the title? How is it? It's, it's a fun. Yes, he's already saying it. It's referred to us. Okay. Compare how God is described in verse number one and verse number seven. This, this verse one and seven. Compare verse one and seven. Is there a, different, a difference in terms of how God is referred to? Uh -huh. Tell it to me. It's very obvious. Someone is mumbling it, but not saying it. No, no, no. The way God is referred to. Thank you. In verse number one, God is referred to as God. You see it there. G O D. How is God referred to in verse number seven? Huh? No, the word there. Lord. The Lord. Capital, okay? Now, see that from verse number one to six, God is only referred to as God. G O D. Beginning in verse number seven, up to verse number 14, every time God is mentioned, is referred to as God, Lord. Is it in your Bible? There's a change in the same passage, in the same psalm. There's a change of how God is referred. Why? Now, when David talks about natural revelation, he refers to God as God, G-O-D. But when he talks about special revelation, which is scriptures from verse 7 to 14, he now switches to refer to God as the Lord, or L-O-R-D, capital. Are you able to appreciate the shift? The shift? He now shifts, because from verse 7, it talks about the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the precept, the commandment, that is the written word of God. Why is that change necessary? Why does it shift? Because it's not there in vain. Why is that necessary? He's telling us that there is something about God that only scriptures can reveal, which is the personal name of God. as covenant-keeping God. Only scripture can do this. Or what you call special revelation. Now, without special revelation, no one can know God as the Lord, Yahweh. So he had to reveal himself to who? Moses, the burning bush. Do you remember? Exodus 3. And he told him that I am who I am. Yahweh, the Lord, the covenant making and keeping God. And he tells him, I had not revealed myself this way to Moses, to, to Abraham. Because Abraham did not have a, a scriptures. And so he reveals the, then himself as the Lord in scriptures in a special way. You cannot know God as the Lord, Yahweh by observing creation, is the point. You cannot know him as a covenant-keeping God by looking at what he has created. But you will know, it, you know him as Lord, no, God. Now, God here, the word used there, is the word Elohim. Elohim means supreme being. Or mighty being. But Lord means covenant 
and personal God. He has a name, personal name. So creation is sufficient to reveal God as Elohim. Elohim is the supreme being, but creation is not sufficient to reveal God as a saving God. A covenant keeping God, a covenant making God, a personal God. I am who I am. That one, he has to take initiative to reveal himself that way, to speak to Moses. And he has to tell him, I have come down to reveal myself to you that I am who I am. I am. I am a covenant keeping and making God. That's why there is a shift from verse number 1 to 6 and verse 7 to 14. To tell you of the difference between how creation reveals God and how scriptures or special revelation reveal God. Yes, please. Yes. As God gives the commandment, mm. he describes himself to Moses in, in verse 2, mm. that I am the Lord, your God. Mm. Otherwise, it would be repetitive. Yes. But clearly, you've helped us to see that there is, in fact, a distinction mm -hmm. between just referring to him as God mm -hmm. and as the Lord. Yes. Thank you so much. That distinction is very important. And we didn't have, I think we have, we have looked at it in Genesis 1 and 2, a few years uh, months or years ago, when the Bible begins with the words, in the beginning, Elohim created heavens and the earth. God. And then somewhere along the way, it, sh it shifts from God to Lord, when he begins now to reveal his character, his person, his perfections, then it shifts to capital. And so the, the Israelites, because they are God's covenantal people, they now know him as the Lord. In fact, they dare mention that, that name. I am who I am, the personal name of God. Now, this is very important, friends, so that we know the extent to which general revelation can reveal God and why we need scriptures, why we need special revelation. That's why it's necessary. That is the extensiveness of God's uh, general revelation. It, it is available universally to everyone, but then it reveals God in a general way, not in a specific way in a way that would be redemptive. So we cannot be redeemed by this form of revelation. Otherwise, Abraham would have been saved by looking at creation. But that was, that was not the case. God had to call him personally from his people, from our Chaldeans, and tell him, come, I'm going to make a covenant with you. He was, while beholding this celestial host, Abraham was still an idol, isn't he? Idolater. It did not help him to know God personally. And so, he was worshipping those things. We are going to see that in, Rome, in Revelation, uh, sorry, in a, uh, uh, Romans chapter 1, in a short while. So, this is when, when God now reveals himself through special revelation, then we can be saved. In other words, this is a redemptive revelation of God. This is a general revelation of God. So this is a general revelation of God. This is a redemptive generation, revelation of God. And a personal one. But something else I want us to observe in this psalm. The eloquence of general revelation. How eloquent is it? How, what is eloquence? If I give you a, another uh, 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 synonym. When you say something is eloquent, what do you mean? Almost it should be here, but so that, yeah. The clarity with which it reveals itself. Clarity. Now hold that word and move with me to uh, verse number three and then move with Romans so that we see the clarity. Let me write it down so that we move there and we see what uh, Mercy is saying, the clarity. It is so clear. God is revealed as the supreme being, the creator being, in a clear way. Now, in verse number three, we already read it. Uh, David says, 
Yes, there is no speech, nor are there words used by this, by what God has created to reveal him, but it is so clear that God is the supreme being and that God is the creator that you cannot deny the existence of God. No one can deny. There's no taste. There's no agnostic in this world. Let no one tell you that I'm an atheist. And so the Bible calls them a fool. A fool says in his heart there is no. That's <laughs> There's nothing like agnostic. They only suppress the truth of God, revealed by your vocation. Move with me to Romans. Chapter number one. To see the point that uh, Brother the Apostle Paul will pick the argument. Someone to read from verse 18 eloquently to verse 23. Yes, please. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So that men are without, just, just, uh, no, later I can have, still have the mic. So that men are without excuse. It is so eloquent, it reveals God eloquently that you can't wriggle out of it. That's what I'm telling you, there's no atheist. There's no atheist in hell. <laughs> There's no agnostic in hell. The people in hell are people who excuse themselves by suppressing the truth of God. No one is in hell. You know, God, I never knew you. So you never reveal yourself to me. So I'm, I'm here by mistake. Please revise, revisit my case. The creation reveals God so clearly as the supreme being, as the creator, that there is no excuse someone can bring before God. And so that's why the, verse 18 says, therefore the wrath of God is revealed upon them. Now, Elder Ken, please continue reading. They are from verse 21. Verse 21. Yes, please. Up to 23. For although they knew God, mm. they neither glorified him mm. as God nor gave thanks to him. Mm. But their thinking became futile mm. and their foolish hearts were darkened. Mm. 22. Mm. Although they claimed to be wise, mm -hmm. they became fools mm -hmm. and exchanged mm -hmm. the glory of the immortal God mm -hmm. for images made to look like mortal man mm -hmm. and birds mm -hmm. and animals mm -hmm. and reptiles. Look at that. How are they described in verse number 22? Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. That's what I said. A fool says, a fool says in his house there is no God. Yet, People think that by science, but by, by discovery, by all these things, they're becoming knowledgeable and they're becoming brilliant. They know it all and we even celebrate them as the great discoveries. People who have, you know, gone around the world and they have come to the conclusion that there's no God. The Bible describes them as fools. For us, we think they are the most brilliant people, isn't it? <laughs> we celebrate them. Darwinianism, isn't it? What a man, homo sapien, and all, all these things. No, these are fools. Now, someone with ESV to read verse number 20. 20. Just 20 alone. Yes, Patrick. Verse 20. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In clearly the perceived. In the things that have been made. So in the things that have been made. Yeah. The things that have been made by God are so eloquent that what is to be understood by God is, can be clearly 
perceived the clarity that our sister was talking about. It is so plain, as Elder said, plainly evident, plain. There's, you can't argue about it. You didn't, don't need rocket science. That's the point, okay? You don't need rocket science to know that God exists just by looking at creation. You don't need someone to come and tell you that, look, here there's God. God exists. That's the point being made here. And so what we're saying here is very serious. First of all, he's saying that these celestial hosts clearly reveal God's glory without ever uttering a word. Although they don't speak, but they clearly reveal God's glory. So that we can know what Elder read, read about the invisible attributes of God in verse 20. Remember that? What were they? Is eternal power and divine nature. Things that can be not known about God. Divine nature. That God is divine is revealed in creation, that God is divine. See the point? So that, that's why uh, our brother Paul is saying, you cannot confuse the creator and the creature. You must come to the conclusion that one is divine, one is not divine, that God is divine. And therefore, it behooves the one who sees creation to worship the divine, not the creator. This is a very clear eloquence of your revelation. Whatever it reveals, it reveals clear, is the point. You cannot miss it. And so judgment will come upon people who, please give Elder Ken Mike again, so that we see the, why that is very serious, what you're saying. In verse number 24 and 25. 24? Yes. Therefore, mm -hmm. God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. 25. Mm -hmm. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Amen. Look at the fool of man. God has revealed himself so clearly, eloquently, Yet man suppresses in verse number 18 the truth revealed by God in what he has created and then man goes ahead not to worship the creator but the creature. So people would rather worship the son but not God. People would rather make for themselves idols but not God. You see the folly there. They are, they are okay worshiping the sun or the moon. So you have the sun God, the moon God. They are okay with it. You can even worship a fellow human being but not God. The only person you want to worship is God. Look at that. So the apostle says, because of that, surely God is just when he judges them. Because this is clear. So, so you're saying therefore that man is without excuse. for not worshiping God. Man is without excuse. People in hell will be judged, first of all, on the basis of general revelation. That alone is enough to send all of us to hell. <laughs> That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Just by God revealing himself in what he has created, that alone is enough to send all of us to hell. Leave alone the coming of Christ. Leave alone the scriptures. That is sufficient to send all of us to hell. Judgment still happens. So you have had people say, well, oh, there are people in the, 
in the, in the Amazon forest who have never heard of Christ. What about them in, when it comes to judgment on the last day? The word is without excuse. They suppress the truth about God. They know that there's a divine being who has eternal power, who has brought everything to existence. He is the source of things, he is the sustainer of things, yet they refuse to worship him for who he is. You cannot wriggle out of this, friends. Don't mention that person in the Amazon forest. He is not safe. <laughs> You'd better tell him about, the, about Christ. <laughs> He's not safe. Now, let's come to our passage, Psalm 19. Come back to Psalm 19. Now, allow me to mention someone who took a different, uh, who responded differently before I, I, we go back to Psalm 19. Please give Mike, Mike the, the mic again. Let's see how Job, who lived before scriptures, would respond to God's revelation by way of general revelation. Job himself. Open to Job and see something in Job and 31. Even Job was not without excuse. Was, so Job and 31. And let's read a few verses, probably um, 26, 28, but we can begin from around 20 something. Job 31, if someone is there, before we mention something, beginning in verse um, 24 to 28. Job 31, 26 yes. to 28. Mm. If I have made gold my trust, mm. or called fine gold my confidence, if I have rejoiced because my wealth was abundant, or because my hand had found much, if I have looked at the sun when it shone, or the moon moving in splendor, and my heart has been secretly enticed, and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an inquiry to be punished by the judges, for I would have been false to God above. Did you hear those words? Especially beginning of verse number 20, 26. If I have looked at the sun, we'll talk about the sun later on in, in back to our passage, when it shone, or the moon moving in splendor, and my heart has been secretly enticed to them, okay? To worship them. And my mouth has kissed my hand. That is, I've paid homage to them. I've worshipped them. Yes. Wow, this is marvelous. This, is, this deserves to be worshipped, okay? Look at what, God, what Job says. This is Job's own confession. Verse 28. This also would be an iniquity, to be punished by the judges, for I would have been false to God above. In other words, I would have failed to worship God by worshiping the creation. Someone with NIV, read that portion of verse number 28, 27, and 28. I, I suspect it, it might put it better. <clears throat> um, from 20. 27, 28. 27, 28. Or it begins from 26 to 28. Um, if I have regarded the sun mm -hmm. in its radiance, mm. or the moon moving in splendor, mm. so that my heart was secretly enticed, mm. and my hand offered them a kiss mm. of homage, mm -hmm. then these also would be sins mm. to be judged. Mm. For I would have been unfaithful mm. to God on high. Look at that. That is Job's conclusion when he looks at the creation and he says, I would be so unfaithful to God by worshipping the moon or the sun and not God. So that man is without what? Excuse. Even Job who existed before, creation, before scriptures is aware of it. Secretly. It does in the heart. Okay? Yeah. Says that is still wrong. That is still unfaithfulness. You begin to see why God gave general revelation. It's a serious thing. <laughs> it tells us of the supremacy of God, this God being a supreme being and God being a crea the creator and not the creature. So that there has to be a distinction between the creator and the creature. And that distinction is there to help us worship the creator being and not the created being. Yes, please. This, this uh, really cuts my heart. Mm. When when we consider in verse 24, mm. 
that uh, sometimes we put our trust in what we have. Mm. Um, even if we say with our mouth that we put our trust in God, mm. uh, because he says, if I put my trust in gold, <laughs> or say it to pure gold, you are my security. For example, if you have some money and you say, I, I think now I'm okay. Mm. For the next one month, I think everything is going to be fine. I'm some covered. <laughs> I'm covered. Because this, maybe you are telling your wife, mm. last year we were doing so badly, but there's some money that has come. Mm. So I think for the next one year, I think we are just okay. Mm. Right there, yes. you See. put your security in your goal. Mm. I'm not in God. I'm not in God. Yeah. And that is idolatry. Worshipping the created, not the creator. Giving, giving confidence or putting confidence in the created and not the creator. You begin to say idolatry. And what Elder Ken is saying is very true. Because idolatry is not simply making those images, isn't it? It is also in how, in how we relate with what, what is created. How we relate with money, how we relate with the human beings. Do we exalt them above God? What about our jobs? Everything. Idolatry is something of the heart. Even sacred. You begin to see this point. I want to wrap up this study. I just I don't want to do three sessions. So give me a, a ten, min, 10 more minutes. It's, it's 10 30 that I, I wrap up because I don't want to uh, do another study on this. God willing, I'll do it much later in time because I want to embark on exposition through John. So give me some 10 minutes to wrap up on the sum. We just have to look at verse number four and six and then we are done. Just quickly which is our third point. We probably would continue to mull over this truth, God willing, some other time, but suffice to say the things you're saying. But let's, let's look at the example of general revelation given by us, uh, to us here. There's an example given to us. And what example have you been given there in verse number 4 to 6? From verse 4 C to 6. In our passage. Someone is saying it slowly and softly. But I had it. <laughs> the son. The son. Now, David begins with generally... The celestial hosts, the heavenly hosts, the sky above and the firmament above. But then he zeroes in on sun. Okay? You see how these are skilled writers. He begins general information, then he goes to specific. He says, let me zero in on an aspect of these celestial bodies, the heavenly bodies called the sun. To show you of how the sun reveals the glory of God. To everyone, everywhere, universally. And it is, it's given, at least in a lifetime, all people have seen the sun, isn't it? It's a point. Now, let's, let's, let's look at those words. Begin with verse number four. For see, it says, talking about the sky above or the heavenly hosts, it says, in them, he, that is God, has set a tent for the sun. Why the tent? Why the language tent? Tent means something that is temporary. temporary. Thank you, Elder. He has set a tent for the sun, meaning whatever you're about to see is some locomotion, some movement of the sun, okay? Okay? Which is in verse number five and six. Which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. So the sun has a tent where he, is, he abides, as it were. Remember, this is poetry, okay? It's poetic language. So it says the sun, as it were, has a tent where it dwells. Then it comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. He's about to receive the bride. So he's arrayed in splendor. He's arrayed in majesty. The magnificent of someone who is about to meet his bride. Those days, the bridegroom would dress and everyone would know that there comes the bridegroom. They would beautifully dress. Okay? That's the first uh, uh, example. And like a strong man runs his course with joy. 
Eliud Kipchoge. So he again uh, compares the sun to an athlete who is running from one point to another and he does his round with full joy. Sometimes when our kids draw the sun, they draw a happy sun, isn't it? And a sad sun. When it is cloudy, the sun is sad. But when it's warm, the sun is happy. Now, he says, like a strong man, not a weak man, because a weak man would collapse, we not have strength, so you not be happy, okay? <laughs> but a strong man has energy, so as he runs, he runs with joy, because he knows he will complete the race. Has the sun failed to complete his race, from the rising to the setting? The sun is very sure that it will accomplish the work, it will cross over. <laughs> And so what is he saying? Why is he comparing the sun to an athlete and a bridegroom? He is talking about the splendor of the sun as a bridegroom. And he's also talking about the penetration, that energy of the sun with which the sun penetrates, and which is in verse number six. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and is circuit to the end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. In other words, the sun penetrates everywhere in the splendor of the sun. Is the point being made here. The point here is that it is so available, accessible to all human beings without exception, without distinction. You cannot avoid to say that you don't know something about the sun. Now, why would David take our eyes up and not down, and not below, not even under the, the earth? At least someone can say, I've never seen a whale or a shark, isn't it? At least I've never seen that animal in the jungle of Amazon. What about the sun? Can someone say that he has never seen the sun? Do you see the point? So he picks the clearest example of general revelation. Master writer, I'm telling you. This is a king. <laughs> the king knows because he's representing someone greater, Christ Jesus. He knows, let me give you the perfect example of general revelation. Something that I will tell you and no one will be without excuse. That they have never interacted with the sun in terms of its light and heat. And he's saying, just like the bridegroom, is that it's as if the, the earth is waiting for the sun like a bride waits for the bridegroom. Even us, we really wait for the sun to wake up to, to come in the morning, isn't it? So that you can wake up and go about our disease. The plants are waiting for the sun to photosynthesize, produce food. Everything on earth is waiting for the sun every morning. And if the sun does not come, we are so gloomy. We are done. That joy with which the earth waits for the sun is the description given to us here. See the beauty of it? Yeah. We always look for the morning. <laughs> They always say, sorrows come in the night, but joy comes in the morning. A watchman really looks for the morning, isn't it? <laughs> looks forward. I, I, I really wish time would move so fast that <laughs> at least few the sun comes, and the night is gone, the day comes, is the description of the sun here. What is David saying here? David is saying simply that the sun is a master revelation of God's glory. The radiance of the sun is like the revelation of God. Why is this important? Quickly, I'm giving you a lot of passages to quickly read so that we make that point. Someone turn to Malachi. Malachi 4.2. Different people to hold the mic. Someone to turn to John 8.12. Hmm. <coughs> Yes, please. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. Yes. Four, 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 yes, 4 2. But for you who fear my name, mm -hmm. the sun of righteousness mm -hmm. shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Oh, that thought, Ezra. Thank you so much. This is how it is written, isn't it? Sun with yes. you. Isn't yes, it? yes, yes. The sun of righteousness. Now, Malachi is predicting the coming of Christ Jesus. Remember, the old covenant ends with Malachi. So he's telling the people of the covenant, but for you, the son of righteousness will come with healings under his wings. We'll just explain that shortly what that means. 
the sun of righteousness. We have the sun given to us that produces the radiance so that everyone sees and we enjoy the heat. But, there, the, but, but the sun of righteousness will come. The one who will bring righteousness over all the earth. The righteousness of God that comes through Christ Jesus will come by the true sun. The one who radiates the glory of? Because the sun radiates light, isn't it? But there will come the true son of righteousness who will radiate the glory of God in all the earth. The righteousness of God. And he will come with willing, healings under his wings. In other words, the same way we have to be protected from the rays of the sun. In the same way he will protect us from the wrath of God under his wings. Because he shall cover us with his righteousness. You see the logic there? With the healings, so that he will prevent us from being consumed by the wrath of God. David is seeing the great David coming. So he, he picks the sun, not the moon. He doesn't pick the moon or the star. He picks the sun. Because the sun has something to do with Christ Jesus. You'll see why Paul picks the sun, this passage in Romans 10, where the glory of God, Christ is going throughout all the earth. Someone, John 8, 12. John 8, 12. It says, Yes, please. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, mm -hmm. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of? Just like the sun is the light of the world, Christ Jesus is the true light of the world. Who gives light of life? So he compares Christ to sun. So that he is the true light of the world. He's the one who lights the world. By his gospel. He does so by, the, by his gospel. Luke 1, 76, 79. Someone to look, look one, someone in Luke 2. Luke 2, 39, 29, 32. Someone in Luke? Yes, please. Luke 1, 76, 79. Give them the mic, please. 76. Yes, please, Dory. Mm. And you, child, mm -hmm. will be called the, prophets of the, the prophet of the Most High. Mm -hmm. For you will go before the Lord mm -hmm. to prepare his ways, mm -hmm. to give knowledge of salvation to his people, in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the, of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise, the, the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light up, I mean to give light, to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death to guide, to guide out feet into the way of peace. Do you see how Christ is described as sunrise? He's talking about the coming of uh, uh, two people. He's talking about, he's talking about his son, that is uh, Zechariah, talking about his son, um, uh, uh, John. But he's saying that uh, you have been told, sent to you know, uh, make way for the, the coming one, in verse number 78. So that Christ described as the sunrise, it shall visit us from on high. Just like the sun comes from, from heaven, Christ comes from heaven, isn't it? <laughs> See the, the correspondence there. So we have to look at heavens. It comes from heaven to visit us from high, to give, us, to give light to those who sit in darkness, those who are waiting for the coming of the light, and in the shadow of death, to, give, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So you have said that he is the light of the world. Chapter 2, 29, 32. Chapter 2, 29 to 32. Eh? Yes. Lord... Now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. Look at how Christ again described by Simeon. It is a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of God to his people Israel. Verse 30 
that his eyes have seen your sal his sal God's salvation, that he has prepared in the presence of all peoples. What's the point in the, of this passage? That Christ Jesus and his glory and righteousness shall be made available to humanity, Gentiles and Jews. The same way the sun shines on both Jews and Gentiles. Everyone, universal. So the sign is a type of Christ to come. That's like the sun gives light to everyone, so Christ will give light to everyone, both Jews and Gentiles. So that there is no sun apart from the son of righteousness, Christ Jesus. In other words, there's no salvation. There's only one son of righteousness for all humanity, Christ Jesus. That's why David, the great David, can only look at heavens and see Christ in his splendor, in his majesty. So he talks about his coming by talking about general revelation. And so Paul picks this in chapter 10 of Romans. Let's conclude that and see why this is very important. Paul refinances that passage that we have just read to talk about how the gospel will permit the four corners of the earth. Romans 10, number 10. Someone with a mic, give them a mic, or the, the Konboni, give the Konboni a mic. Romans 10. Yes, please, as, as I have. Uh, chapter, number, chapter number 10 and verse 17 and 18. Romans 10, 17 and 18. Yes, please. So faith comes from hearing mm -hmm. and hearing through the word of Christ. Mm -hmm. But I ask, have they not heard? Mm -hmm. Indeed they have, for their voice for their voice have gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Thank you. So Paul is referencing Psalm 19. Verse number three. And is equating the fact that the gospel will go to all corners of the earth the word of Christ, to the way the sun shines in all the world. And so Christ himself will say, says, in, as he talks about the, uh, the, the, the end of times, he says, and this gospel shall be proclaimed in all the earth. Then the end shall come. The same way the sun is available universally, in the same way the gospel of Christ will permeate in all the world, and then Christ will come. By his gospel, so is the great revelation of God. The gospel has to permeate, the same way the sun permeates everywhere, penetrates everywhere, is the same way the gospel of Christ Jesus will permeate everywhere. Why? Back to this, so that no one will be without excuse. The same way we can't excuse ourselves from general revelation, the same way no one will excuse themselves from the gospel of Christ, the son of righteousness. So we have even a, a greater revelation, not just the son, but the son of righteousness, Christ Jesus. How privileged are we that for us, Christ has brought the righteousness that we so much desperately need. And he brings healing with his wings so that we are not consumed by the wrath of God, but we are protected from the wrath of God, just like every children from the strong rays of the sun. See how then the revelation ends in an amazing way when Christ is coming. That is the point that is being made here. Let me, for those writing, let me just write it down. Romans 10, 17 to 18. If you want to write it down. Any questions, please? I'm not going to continue with this series because I want to go back to exposition of 1 John. We have seen in our shell what general revelation is about. And it's intended purpose. The intended purpose in an shell for general revelation and scripture is to point us to Christ. Same way the sun points us to Christ. The same way scriptures point us to Christ. All these things are meant, they converge in one person, Christ Jesus, all of them. General revelation, special revelation, they converge in revealing Christ to us for salvation. That's the beauty of it. Any question? Any thoughts? If I pray. Okay, thank you so much. Let me conclude with other prayer.